Father, thank you. Thank you when, that when you look down on the confusion, the darkness, the violence and aggression, the human condition, your response was love. For you so loved the world, not hated the world, but loved the world, that you gave your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That is your gospel. That is your good news, that your response is love. And boy, do we need to learn how to love like that beginning with loving you and then learning to love ourselves so that we can love others in a healthy way. Thank you for the Word, the Spirit, and community, the church. Thank you for knowing what we need in order to learn, grow, and contribute. We thank you for every prayer that was prayed. Thank you for the communion table. Thank you for fellowship, representatives, worship, every song. Thank you for your presence throughout. And now, Father, we turn our hearts and minds to the wisdom and instruction of your word. Touch our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and our hearts to receive. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Come on, greet three people before you're seated. Bless them in the name of the Lord. <laughs> By the way, for those of you who are not at that place of biblical literacy, and you're wondering why we would have a song praising Yahweh and not Jesus. <laughs> Y'all got that. Well, you're a sharp congregation. I love you. I love you. Thank you. Thank you. Make me look good here. Thank you. Yeah. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. Amen. And some people get confused. There's some people who think that Christ is Jesus' last name. And they're still trying to wrestle through that. But it points to the fact that serious Bible study. How many of some serious students of the Bible in here? Okay, we've got ten of you. Thank you. <laughs> serious Bible study transcends self-help and self-therapy. Now, it's great that you open the Psalms and start your day, or should I say end your day. You should be opening Proverbs and starting your day with some wisdom, and then opening Psalms at night before you go to bed to end your day with reflection, devotion, and appreciation and gratitude. Amen. And it's good that you can take the text and be inspired to do great things, right? Because uh, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Hallelujah. For we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Hallelujah. That's a good place to start. And if you have to continually stay there, it means that you're not convinced about those things. Because once you're convinced about those things, you dig deeper. You get into the foundation of things. So serious Bible study. Say serious Bible study. And I'm saying this because I was in a conversation uh, yesterday with two of our members. And I, and I shared this text, and they loved it so much. They said, Pastor, can you just 
you know, get that to me. Serious Bible study means constantly re-evaluating your thinking as you study, learn, and grow. I'm going to say it again. Serious Bible study means constantly reevaluating your thinking as you study, learn, and grow. As you study, learn, and grow. And God has called us to learn, grow, and contribute. To learn, grow, and contribute. Let's try that again. God has called us to what? Learn, grow, and contribute. How and what you learn determines how you grow, and how you grow determines what you contribute. So if you're not learning, substantively, right, substantively, if you're not learning with accuracy, if you're not learning in a healthy way, then your growth is going to be unhealthy. And guess what? So will be your contribution. We're here to give back. Well done, good and faithful servant means you did something. So we're here to what, CCC? Come on. The scripture says, and Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and gained favor with God and man. So we're here for three reasons. What are they? Come on. Learn, grow and contribute. And is God concerned about how we learn? Jesus said, take heed how you hear. Take heed what you hear. What you hear is the content. How you hear is how you process that information. And for the Christian, you know the text, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the what? Renewing of your mind. Because only then will you be able to, the rest of the text, prove what is good, what is acceptable, what is the perfect will of God. And the word perfect doesn't mean flawless, it means complete. So we have a responsibility to study. But serious study, serious study of Scripture means constantly reevaluating your thinking as you study, learn, and grow. And here at CCC, I try to do that. And the ministers try to do that every time that we get up. We want to make you think about your faith, how you apply it, how you're living it. We want to make you think critically about your faith. It is dangerous, and let me tell you something, if you ever go to a meeting and they say, check your brain at the door and then come in, don't go in. <laughs> Definitely don't check it. You want to think critically. What sets us apart from every other species is that we are rational beings, our rationality. We have the capacity for rationality. We don't always use it, but we have the capacity for rationality. And that's why God can say to a people who are in sin, he said, though your sins be as scarlet, right? Come, let us reason together. Let's think this through. And as you study the scripture, as you mature, you gain new knowledge, understanding, and wisdom, and experience. Guess what? Certain texts that you thought you knew, you discover in a new way. Come on, how many have gone back and read a passage and said, wow, I didn't see that? And my job is to show you things that you don't see. So when you sit and you hear and you say, man, I look at that text so many times, I didn't see that. What's wrong with me? Nothing's wrong with you. All right? Because if that, weren't, if that didn't happen to you, I wouldn't have a job. <laughs> but the scripture in Ephesians 4 says that when he ascended on high, 
He led captivity captive and gave what? Gifts to men. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some pastors and teachers and evangelists. When Peter was ready, after his crisis, Jesus said, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Right? Feed my sheep. The prophet Jeremiah, the Spirit of God said, the time will come when I'll give you pastors or shepherds after my own heart who will feed you with knowledge and understanding so that you're not afraid, nor are you lacking. And I want to highlight that word, lacking, because it means deficiency. I was in a meeting discussing poverty uh, this past week and thinking through how to approach issues of poverty. And pointed out that poverty is not just deficiency in material goods. Jesus talked about spiritual poverty. The poor in, come on, spirit. You've read it in the Beatitudes. So there is spiritual poverty. There is emotional poverty, as well as economic poverty. There's intellectual poverty. Poverty comes in various forms and has different causes. But essentially, it's deficiency. It means we're lacking something. And our theology of the house here is that original sin resulted in a deficiency. It wasn't a cancer that we all caught and we're dying from and then just Jesus comes and heals the cancer. No, we lost something when we were separated from God. And guess what? Whenever you're separated from God, you are deficient. And that's why when Paul was upset because he couldn't overcome something in his own life and he cried out to God three times, take this from me. What was God's response? My grace is sufficient. Why? Because your sufficiency is in your relationship with me. So apart from God, we suffer deficiency. We lost holiness and of God, the justice of God. So I want to pick up where Pastor Jamal left off in his list and continue to build on that. Continue to weave our theme this year of renewal. Continue to point to signs of the times, which we'll touch on. But let me give you a framework. Say framework. framework. Worldview, world view, your worldview, how you view the world, right? Your worldview, how you view the world, which includes yourself and others and everything else in this thing we call the world, your worldview is a narrative about the world in which we live. Your worldview. And everybody has one, whether it's intentional or whether it just materialized as a result of all of the things that have influenced and shaped your thinking. Your worldview is a narrative about the world in which we live. A narrative is a spoken or written account of connected events. It is a spoken because it comes from oral tradition, or it's written because it has been preserved in text. So your worldview is a narrative. A narrative informs our beliefs, our assumptions, and our choices. Wow. That's a problem if you don't know your worldview. Because it means that you have a narrative influencing your beliefs, your assumptions, and your choices, and you don't even realize that it's influencing you. So you must be intentional 
about your worldview. What narrative is driving me? Do you know that evolution is a narrative produced by science about the world in which we live? A sequence of events that are connected to each other beginning with a big bang? Everything just appeared. It's a narrative. It's a narrative that informs people's what? Beliefs, their assumptions, what they assume, right? And their choices. Now, whether you agree with evolution or not, or its forms, it's still a narrative that's influencing our world and influencing the way people think. Isn't it true? Yeah. How many know the Bible is a narrative? It's a worldview. It's a narrative. It, 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 it is a sequence of events that are connected to each other that tell a story. And from that story, we are informed in terms of our beliefs, what we believe, what we assume about life, about people, about ourselves, and it influences the choices that we make. So the biblical narrative is critical. And when you say, well, I don't believe that there really was a, an Adam and an Eve. Maybe it's just the story that God used. Well, I'll tell you what, even if you reduce it to allegory, all right, it's still a very powerful story that captures so much of our human experience, which takes genius because we're still unpacking Genesis chapter 1 and 2. Thousands of years later. So to try to criticize the text doesn't work because the reality is the text continues to shape lives. One of the things that fascinated me very much about Jesus, there are in the Gospels, the four Gospels, 34 references to crowds. Did you hear that? Now, there were exorcists, there were itinerant preachers preaching so many different things in his day and time. But why is it that historians cannot get beyond the crowds that he attracted? If he were around today, he'd probably have quite a few likes and followers. In fact, he already has two billion followers today. With no Instagram no Facebook, are you all hearing me? No Twitter account. But he's got two billion followers. The crowds, the people were so impacted by what he had to say that they could not keep away. And in fact, when he spoke, they didn't want to let him go. In fact, in, in, in one scenario, the religious leaders who were plotting against him sent some Roman soldiers that were assigned to them, to Jesus, just to trap him and arrest him. They got there and joined the crowd, heard what he had to say, were baffled by it, went back to those who sent them and came without him. And they said, well, what, what happened? And they said to, to those individuals who said, we never heard anybody talk like that. And of course, their response was, has he bewitched you too? <laughs> His message, what he had to say, how he responded was so profound. That's why I tell people it's not the institution of Christianity that saved me. It's the person of Jesus. He's the one that captured my mind, my heart, my emotions, my will, seized me, arrested me, and hasn't let me go since then. Anybody else know the person? Turn your neighbor and say, neighbor, you don't get to heaven by what you know. You get there by who you know. So last week when Pastor Jamal listed that, those eight elements, it was a framework for the biblical narrative. I'm giving you language so that you can talk about this, understand this. It was a framework. What does a framework do? It creates a system or structure 
for information, for a narrative, for a story. So what, what, what I did early on to try to make sense of, of all of that information, how many know there's a lot of information in the Bible? Yeah. That's why it takes you a year to read through it. it takes time, right? But how can we have a, a, a framework? And that's what we shared with you. And we're putting that into, through NSBT, into a textbook that includes hermeneutics and an examination of the ancient world. But it begins with creation. And it ends with consummation, which means completion of all things. And what does it complete? It completes God's redemptive plan. Because what is the overarching theme of this biblical narrative? The redemption of humanity and the restoration of creation the way God intended it. And that's why where your theology begins is critical. If it begins with the fall, that that theology will have it as foundation. What's wrong with us? If it begins with creation, that at the foundation of that theology will have what's right with us. And Jesus came to fix. One leads to guilt and despair. The other leads to excitement and anticipation and appreciation. So... The biblical narrative is our narrative, our story. It informs our what? Come on. Beliefs, assumptions, and our choices. How many have had the Bible influence your choices? How many felt the influence of Scripture on your choices? Yeah, what you choose and what you choose not to choose. That's a good one. Yeah. It gives you a set of values, and your values are what's most important to you, what you stand for, what you're willing to fight for. It gives you a set of values. Because every decision we make in life is a value judgment. I'm going to say that one again because you need to write it down. Every decision we make in life is a value judgment judgment. You're placing value on one thing over another. Beautiful passage in the book of Acts says, and Moses chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. He made a value judgment. He responded in the wrong way, and God had to chill him out for a few years, and then call him. But every decision you make in life is a value judgment. This is very powerful in, in husband and wife relationship, or, or girlfriend and boyfriend relationships. How many understand what I'm talking about here? It's funny, I'm using language that, I have to, that I'm conscious of now. Do I have to explain that? <laughs> but within the context of those relationships, each partner is watching to see and, 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 and they evaluate the decisions that the other partner makes, or the spouse makes, right? Or the friend makes, because they're, they're looking at it as a value judgment. This is very true when it comes to men and women, husbands and wives, because wives are watching the value of the decision that the husband is making. Because it's always somehow telling her how important she is to him. And if he doesn't get that, Oh, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. <laughs> That's real. So, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. All right, this is good preaching here. Someone asked me, you know, how long, have you how long did it take to prepare that sermon? All my life. <laughs> so let's go to the Gospel of Luke. And I want to highlight certain things.
Does that look political? Huh? Is that political language? Or is that spiritual? So help me out. Am I, am I spelling okay here? All right. Am I okay? My spelling is better than Pastor Jamal's penmanship. I'll tell you that much. He's ministering in Long Island today, and we're not live streaming, so. Well, we are live streaming, but not to Long Island. Yeah, no, no. I spell better than he writes. Anyway, <laughs> the marginalized and those who are in what? Power. The oppressed and the oppressor. The left and the right. Now, that's definitely political language here in America, right? But remember what I said. Government was created by God, but politics was created by who? People. Politics is essentially the art of winning and holding on to power. And we've made it an art. In fact, you can study political science in school. Do you have any political science uh, graduates here? Anybody study political science in school? Yeah, some of you. Was it that bad that you only raise your hand halfway? <laughs> wow, sorry. Yeah. So politics is the art. God created government for specific reasons. And then we step in and we create all of these systems and structures and ideas. And, and, and I want to speak to some of the division that we have in our nation. So I'm going to talk a little faster. And we're not going to finish this today, but I want to introduce it. All right. Because in Christ, these, these divisions don't exist. I'm going to try that one more time. Christians, in Christ, these divisions don't exist. You know why? Because some of the things that he did would put him on the... And some of the things he did would put him on the... He didn't only address the... But he also addressed the... He had a passion for the... But also spoke to those in... And even when he chose his staff, there was one on the, and one on the, well, what about the others, Pastor? There was 12. Isn't there 10 more? Well, the one on the left and the one on the right are the only ones that were politically and socially highlighted. And yet, Jesus called them to work together around a common cause. I can imagine some of the conversations that may have taken place with the twelve sometimes when the one on the left reared his head and said, we got we to gotta, we gotta deal something. We got to overthrow that government. And the one on the right said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm a tax collector. You're dealing with my income. Simon was a zealot. That was a, a, a radical political party that lived for the overthrow of the Roman government and the liberty, the, the releasing, the freedom of the Jewish people who were under the Roman power. Matthew was a tax collector. In fact, he's the one who wrote about these and highlighted the differences. Matthew was a tax collector. And please understand, I was saying yesterday, tax collector is a, what we know today as a customs agent. In other words, the taxation was charged when people were coming and going and bringing goods and services. And the Roman government said, we want X amount. 
Whatever you charge is on you, which meant the tax collector or the customs agent could elevate the price depending upon how they felt or what or the, their level of greed. And that's why they were so hated. And that's why Jesus, the, the, the religious leaders, got upset with him when he sat having dinner with them. Why does your master spend time with tax collectors and sinners? So tax collectors and sinners were in the same pot. And the only reason they could do that is because they had a relationship with the Roman government. And yet these two guys were on his staff. Working together in harmony. <laughs> Don't you think for one minute that their humanity did not raise up even though it's not recorded. We know we were dealing with human people, real people. And can you imagine some of the tensions at some of the meetings? And Jesus made sure that as they were watching, because he knew they were watching him, he made sure that his movements shut everybody up. And we're going to look at that movement as we prepare. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18, verse 35. And I'm using the King James. Ooh. Witherest, hitherest, thitherest. <laughs> Lovest thou meest. The King James. Luke chapter 18, verse 35. And it came to pass that as he was come, what? And the nigh, the word nigh means near, right? Right? As he had come nigh or near Jericho, a certain what? Come on. A certain what? I can't hear you. So Jesus was on his way to Jericho. A blind man, right? But where was the blind man? Huh? In proximity to the city. Where was he? When he came near the city. It was a blind man. See, they didn't have suburbs the way we got suburbs. What was, where the power, the economics was, was in the city. If you lived on the outskirts, right, you were the marginalized. You didn't have a nice home out on the island. You were in the outskirts. So the blind man represents more than someone who, who, who needs healing, right? He symbolizes something. And his location symbolizes something. He's on the outskirts of the city, on the outskirts of power, on the outskirts of the economic. He represents the marginalized. And let me tell you something, you got, see, and that's why I say, you've got, as you become a serious Bible student, you begin to think it through deeper. You dig the text and try to understand it in the context. Because listen, listen, you know, we, we, we celebrate, hallelujah, Jesus is going to heal this guy. How many read the text? How many know that Jesus is going to heal this blind man? He cries out to Jesus, right? He's a blind man. Now, now, listen, people think that when you get saved, everything gets wonderful. Sometimes it gets worse before it gets better. Tell, you, talk to, tell to your neighbor, say, he's talking about somebody you know. <laughs> Had a woman come to the church. She said, Pastor, I was going to this XYZ church, I'm not going to say. And I was fine, but I wanted more from God, so I came here so I could learn. And I came here, and it's like all hell broke loose. I'm having more problems now. But the thing is, I'm enjoying it. I'm, a, I'm dealing with it differently. See, saints and sinners go through, or, or saints and ace, or non-believers and believers. How's that? That's a little bit better. See, I'm evaluating my language and process here. We all experience the same life, but we experience life differently. We approach it differently. So as Jesus is getting near, is getting near to Jericho, he encounters a what? A blind man. 
And why I say you got to think things through, because consider this. Jesus heals the blind man, right? Do you know that that left him healed? He can now see, but now he was in trouble. The first piece of trouble handed to him was economic trouble. Because when he was blind, he had an excuse to beg and people to give him money. Now he got sight. What's he going to do now? You see, we don't think it through. We look at the miracle and say, hallelujah. I said, when I read, I said, uh-oh, this guy's going to have some problems here. Not only that, they, the people knew who he was. So not only did he get healed, but he had a reputation. And how many people did he manipulate in order to survive? And Jesus comes and gives him sight. Hallelujah. And the man has his eyes open. He experiences, oh, oh, I can see. Uh-oh. You've got to process, what does that mean now? So it's on the outskirts of Jericho. Where is it? On the what? Outskirts of Jericho. Let's go to another text, all right? Let's go to Luke 19, 1. Same book of Luke, same gospel of Luke. We go from verse, chapter 18, verse 35, to chapter 19, verse 1. And Jesus, what? Come on. Come on. And Jesus, what? Entered and passed through. So, so in chapter 18, verse 35, where is he? Where is he? He's on the outskirts, right? He's on the outskirts. He's on the perimeter of whatever society is concentrated in the city. And he's, he's moving. He, he deals with the blind man. You get read the story. You probably read it already. I hope you did. All right. But the blind man cries out and Jesus heals him. And now he's, he's moving on. So he moves from, from, from the marginalized blind man who was, look, part of the oppression system that was there in Jericho. Understand that this blind man was not only a victim of him not having sight, but he was also a victim to whatever systems and structures were in place and whatever value they placed upon people like him. Because if the systems and structures didn't place any value on people like him, he was left to struggle on his own. And hope for the goodwill of individuals who would give him something. And most likely, there was nothing in place. But he was on his own. So Jesus continues his journey. Now he's, he, this text says that, that he is now what? He's entered Jerusalem. And he's passed, I mean, Jericho. And he's passing through, right? So this next individual. And behold, there was a man named what? Come on. Zacchaeus. How many know the story of Zacchaeus? Which was the, come on, chief among the publicans. It didn't say re-publicans. It simply said publicans, which is King James language for tax collectors. Got it? So he was in a position of what? Power. In fact, let's just read the rest of the text. What does it say about him? He was what? He was what? He was in a position of power, <laughs> and he was wealthy as a result of that power. So notice, we move in, 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 in just a, a few verses from the marginalized and the oppressed individual on the outskirts to inside the city where we encounter the power structure. And it's symbolizes by this man, Zacchaeus. And what does Jesus say to him? He says, how many know the story about Zacchaeus? I, I, we don't have the time to read through it, but read it when you want. He, he, right, he was a man of short stature. Remember the story? And Jesus is walking. Remember, Jesus wasn't walking by himself. There was a parade of people. Remember those crowds I talked about? Right? There was always a, a crowd of people gathering around him, plus his disciples. And he points Zacchaeus out because what? Zacchaeus wants to see this guy. He heard about him. He wants to see this guy. He climbs a tree. 
And from up in the tree, he's watching. And he wasn't there to encounter Jesus in any way. He just wanted to see. And, and, and because of his message and his miracles, it, 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 it stirred in the hearts of people a curiosity, if not a belief. And what does Jesus do? Zacchaeus! Come on down. I've got to go to your house today. Can you imagine what was in that man's mind? Now, listen, listen. He was rich, but he was short. How do we unpack that one? Did he have a Napoleonic complex? We don't know. How did he exercise his power? We do find out. So he comes down, Jesus comes to his house, and Jesus says, salvation has come, this day, salvation has come to your house, to this house. And the disciples, remember the disciples, then, whoa, wait a minute. What happened to the gospel to the poor? Set at liberty those that are bound, open the prison doors, set the captives free. So when you read the text, go back and read it in chapter 19, they criticize Jesus. They're critical of him for engaging with this individual, this rich and powerful individual who is exploiting his own people. How could Jesus be in a relationship with that man? And to say salvation has come? And if you read the text, Jesus says to his disciples, understand that this man too is a child of Abraham. In spite of his wrong and his positions of power, he still needs what was promised to Abraham, which is me. And notice the impact, because first Jesus is on the outskirts of Jericho, dealing with the blind man, the marginalized, right? The disenfranchised, the discriminated against. I could really get deep on this. And then he goes into the city and he meets the power broker. And in reaction... Zacchaeus says, what? I've never felt anything like this. Jesus, let me say something. Honor those you want to influence. We tend to attack those we want to influence. He honored them. He honored him. He honored the man by going to his house. And all the religious folks, including his staff, had a problem with that. And what was, the, what was the effect of that encounter? Because Zacchaeus now makes a promise, <laughs> which is interesting, we read the detail. He said, I'm going to give half of my wealth to the poor. And then he says, he says, and if I've stolen anything, what do you mean if? <laughs> read the text, enjoy the story. He said, and if I've stolen anything, I'm going to return it. Yeah, that's hyperbole. But we get what was happening. He was having a moment of facing himself as a rich person in a position of power and reflecting on how much he's exploited others like the man who was met on the outskirts of society. And what do we get from this? I'm glad you asked. Jesus heal the oppressed and loved the oppressor. In one stroke, he dealt with power structure in society. Now, can you imagine Zacchaeus, who is the chief tax collector? Jesus, as a result of that encounter with this man, changed a person and influence systems and structures and cause a, redistri a radical redistribution of wealth. That's why they want to kill him, because he was dangerous. You're upsetting things here. What do you mean the high was going, are going to be made low? What are you talking about, Jesus? So that was a setup. 
And then after the encounter, his disciples are, are, are puzzled now because they're trying to interpret what they just experienced. They saw him at both ends of the spectrum. The marginalized, the disenfranchised, those in power, and yet he's embracing and transforming both of their lives. One by changing his physical condition and the other by changing his heart and his mind. And all of a sudden, a conversation is struck about the kingdom of God. Let's go to it in Luke chapter 19. Let me scroll down here. Verse 9, and Jesus said to him, this is one of the disciples who was upset, but this is after Zacchaeus says, I'm going to restore. <laughs> All right, well, you know, we, we've got to read verse 8. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I've, if I've taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said to him, This day salvation has come to his house. Not because Jesus came, but because he responded to Jesus' coming. And Jesus continued, for so much as he also is a son of Abraham. And here's the text. Here's the text. Number two, uh, verse 10. For the son of man is come to seek and to save. Come on. Come on. That which was lost. And as they heard, his disciples heard these things, he added and spoke a parable because he was near to Jerusalem. Right? And why else? Why else did he speak this parable? Come on. Come on, why else? Oh, where's the text? Hey, where's my staff in the media room? They know what I look like. Put the text on the screen. There you go. And as they heard, come on, as they heard these things, he added and spoke a parable for two reasons. Number one, because he was near to Jerusalem. And things were about to go down in Jerusalem. Right? Right? But what's the second reason? The second reason what I want to focus on. Second reason is because they what? They thought the kingdom of God should, let's go to the next verse, immediately appear. So as a result of their assessment of his movements, dealing with the poor and disenfranchised, dealing with the power structure, those in power and those systems that they represented, they were formulating an understanding of the kingdom and they felt, ah, this is it. It's ready. And this is why they were charged up about going to Jerusalem. Because when he went into Jerusalem, what was he going to do? He was going to come on the back of a donkey. Come on. Did you read the book? To fulfill the prophecies that were spoken. They're going to say, Hosanna. In the highest, Hosanna. They're going to celebrate him thinking that, okay, he's now going to lead us. And overthrow the Roman government. So they're formulating a, a, an idea, a concept of the kingdom that was faulty and he had to correct it. And so he gives a parable. He tells a story. And parable, para means alongside. He said, therefore, a certain... Verse 12, therefore a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered. Now look, look, look. Just those words went somewhere, right? Into a far place, right? Far country to what? Receive for himself a kingdom, which he's talking about his inauguration as the king was with yet to come. All right? And then to what? to return, to come back. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. Say, Occupy till I come. <laughs> so he was saying, he was announcing, Look, some things are going to go down. The kingdom is not going to come immediately right now. There's some things that have to happen. Uh, A.R. Bernard has to get saved in order for that to happen. Two thousand years have to take place. Some history, you know. How many are included in that story? Yeah, you had to get saved too. Because he wanted us to be in that number. A part of that whole experience. Right? He says, but while I'm gone, I want you, 
and I want this word to share its own screen. I want you to what? For how long? Until I return. What does he mean by occupy? How do we understand the, 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 the language in which this was spoken by Jesus to his disciples? How do we unpack this and respond to it? Because evidently, it's our call to action, to life, to thinking, to emotions, to choices, everything. Occupy till I come. Occupy. And next Sunday, when we come back here, we're going to unpack, occupy, till I come. What does it mean? How do we understand it? My youngest grandchild, I have 25, oh, Pastor Karen has them too, 25 grandchildren, and our, our last grandchild is... Uh, a, a granddaughter and she's so sweet and somehow I was whispering to her to say Papa before she said Dada <laughs> and it worked <laughs> but the problem is how she says it because I was whispering it in her ear so now whenever she calls me she says Papa <laughs> as though it's this big secret between her and I. Close your Bible. Did you get anything out of this today? That's an amazing book, that Bible. And people who criticize it know just enough to criticize it. Yesterday, I talked a little bit about, with the staff about me not saying in the name of Jesus because I was being raked over the cold. And it's important that we unpack that. What does it mean? Is it words of incantation that we attach to the end of our prayer? The model prayer that Jesus gave did not have in the name of Jesus at the end of it. And out of all the prayers in the New Testament, only two ended in the name of Jesus. Others ended in some way. And as you look back at church history, it became a tradition in more recent phases. But what they understood as in the name of Jesus was not magic words that we attach all right, they understood it as an authority that came by way of relationship. How many have ever read the, the, um, the story in the book of Acts of the seven sons of Siva? You remember? See, and exorcisms were big around that time. So the use of incantation was a big deal. So they were trying to use the name of Jesus as though it was an incantation, like Alakazam, Alakazoom. And you just attach it to the end of your prayer, and your prayer all of a sudden has power. So someone who wanted to be a sorcerer and exorcist decided, and this is what he said to a man who was demon-possessed, the book of Acts. He said, he said, I adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. And he got what he wanted. The demons responded. They said, I don't think they look like that, but I'm just getting the feel of it. So, said, well, Paul we know. Jesus we know. But who, who, just who, Because they use in the name of Jesus as words for authority. But what was missing? The relationship. It is not the words. It's the relationship that gives it power. When he said, whatever you ask in my name, he's talking about those in relationship with me. Because if you don't have the relationship, you don't have the juice. And you're going to be challenged by spiritual forces and powers when you call yourself representing him with whom you don't have a relationship with. I got to stop here. I'm sorry. 
I'm sorry. Now let me just tell you a secret. It got out about 50 years ago. I'm sorry, 48 years ago that I'm a Christian. It got out that I'm in relationship with Jesus. I'm being sarcastic. It's the relationship, folks. There's nothing wrong with using in the name of Jesus. But it's not a requirement to give your prayer some authority or legitimization. Because there are times when you pray, Lord, I need your help on this one. Oh, oh, wait. In the name of Jesus. I'm not diminishing the power because demons tremble at the sound of that name with respect and reverence for that name, but only when the person using it has the relationship with Jesus that warrants that authority, that legitimizes that authority. But I said, I'm going to stop here. Come on, let's all say. Folks just get me riled up. There was so much more to that prayer than the end of it. And that's why we're going to unpack it and share it with you. Well, why don't you slap high five with three people today and say, I got that word. Jesus went after the oppressed and the oppressor, the systems and structures and the people in those systems and structures to create change, to make a difference in society, make a difference. He didn't choose one over the other. And I know he's been painted in so many different ways, but let's let the scripture speak on his behalf. Amen. Come on, give God a good hand clap offering. It begins with who you know. And our minister is going to come forward now, lead you in prayer. And I didn't do this. Thank you, every one of you that have joined us virtually across the country, around the world, and across the street. Thank you for being with us. You are a part of our spiritual family. Come on, let's give some love and appreciation for all of our virtual members around the world. Hallelujah. Minister Dario is going to lead you in prayer and direction, and then he's going to close the service. Thank you. I love you guys. It is a pleasure to be a pastor, to feed God's sheep, especially for this congregation. God bless you. Come on, family, let's just praise God for an amazing word. Amen. <laughs> family, let me just pray over us. If you would just bow your head and close your eyes. So, Father, in the name of Jesus. And God, we thank you that we're in relationship to proclaim that authority. And so, Father, I pray for your people in a very real and tangible way. Father, we heard today transform us help us to navigate and not alienate God I'm praying for your people today that they will be salt and light in the places in which you've placed them to be father whether that be on their job whether that be in their family in their neighborhoods God I pray that you will help us navigate conversations. Conversations in spaces to be your representatives and to be your influence. God, we want to give you glory where we're at, Lord God. So, Father, as a congregation, we accept that responsibility to be salt and light. 
And Father, we thank you that you're going to show us and teach us through our pastor how to occupy. So Father, bring glory. Father, show us how to use us to change people in ways that culture can be transformed. And Father, for those who are here, maybe online and those present in this room and family, I'm speaking to you. If you are being moved right now to be in a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, this moment is for you. God said this very simply in John 3, 16, and we quote it all the time. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. So the good news is this, that God sent his son to earth as a man so that through his life, death, and resurrection, we might be saved and rescued. Amen. So if this is you, I'm going to ask that you will repeat this prayer after me. And we'll repeat it with you. Simply say this, God, thank you for speaking to me personally today. I recognize my need for you. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to die on a cross for my sins. Thank you, Jesus, for paying the full price so that I can be in right relationship with you. Amen. Let's give a round of applause for those who might have by faith. So if you're online, we're going to ask that you give us a call. You're going to text the number on the screen and give us a call so that we can speak to you personally. If you're here and if you accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, we say welcome to the family. Welcome to, to our right relationship with God. And we would like to talk to you. And some of our ministers will be out in the vestibule. And we would love to put something into your hands. Amen? Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor. It's time to occupy. Come on, say it like you may say, neighbor, it's time to occupy. Now let's say something amazing as we leave this place, but never God's presence. Say it loud, say it proud. Jesus is Lord, period. We believe it, we pro, and we're... God bless you, family. Family, thank you so much for watching CCC's YouTube channel. If you feel what you just experienced impacted your life in any way, we encourage you to like, subscribe, and share this video with others so we can fulfill our mission in spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. We welcome you to check out some of our other videos. Also, make sure to click the notification bell so you are the first to know when we post a new one. Our praise and worship team brings us a powerful and dynamic live worship experience every Sunday. And trust me and Cameron when I say, you do not want to miss it. Streaming times are in the description box below. And if you are looking for any other information about what's happening here at CCC, visit www.cccinfo.org. We hope to see you next Sunday, but for now, continue to have a blessed week in the Lord.